welcome back to Into the Light, a different life story with me, Stefan Neff, as your host. Um, we are on YouTube and as a podcast. And whilst you're here, go down there, press that subscribe button, and later on, tell your friends about the fantastic interview that you just listened to. And it's going to be a fantastic interview because I've got Shannon Levy with me. Shannon is a warrior who has battled not just her body for much of her life, but also her own demons. Uh, like me, she has tried to escape reality uh, in a number of ways. And and uh, it, it takes such balls to turn your life around. And Shannon did exactly that. And nowadays she is coming out. She's breaking the taboo. She's she's breaking the silence and she's coming out and is discussing her own story. And with that, she is giving others hope and others the big message that guys, yes, whatever, however dark your life is or was, there is help out there. Go find it. And hopefully we can plant together the seed today to help you forward in your own journey. So Shannon, thank you so much for coming onto my show. Thank you so much, Stefan. I'm excited to be here. This is great. Uh, that's beautiful. And uh, uh, normally I always go back to, to you know, what did you want to do as when you were a little girl? But I think with you, I think we start with the catalyst. We actually um, want to see, hang on, when did your life turn around? Uh, when did your life occur? When did you change occur, shall I say? Um, well, just your first question. I grew up with a bunch of boys and I actually wanted to be a trucker when I was a little girl. And my favorite toy was Stretch Armstrong, which is so funny. Who was um, Stretch Armstrong? So, so I, that was it, a, a, a body kind of uh, Armstrong, it, I mean. <laughs> well, no, it was a doll. So instead of me wanting to play with girl dolls, it was this doll that you stretched. And yeah, so it kind of worked out your arms, but if you put it like in a warm place, it would be easier to stretch. So um, yeah, so I grew up playing with Stretch Armstrong and Tonka trucks and and clutch poppers. Do you remember clutch poppers? <laughs> Not really. I don't oh, think yeah, they made it in Germany. Yeah, they're, they're, they're little cars that took off. So um, even though you didn't really ask me that, I answered it anyway. <laughs> And that's that's and that already shows me that you are a woman who has got her own story actually finally nailed. So there you were as a young woman, young, you know, what was it uh, in in your probably before teens, um, growing up. Were were you encouraged by your parents to be that girl, that sort of the tomboy, the the the, the girl that breaks the mold as far as genders are concerned? Yeah. So I was the firstborn girl. Um, I have three younger brothers and my mom was so busy with them. So I hung out at the farm on the, at the barn with my grandfather, who funny enough was an alcoholic and, but we clicked because, you know, I get him and he gets me and yeah. So my favorite pastimes is wearing my rubber boots and shoveling shit, <laughs> carrying it out in the wheelbarrow and, uh, Actually, there's a there's a um, a plaque behind or a uh, shelf behind me that's a piece from the barn. So the room that I'm in is called the Rustic Haven, which is part of my reflexology business. So um, I have a piece of him in the barn with us today, which is awesome. Oh, how beautiful is that? Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. So how did the trucking business go when you left school? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so much a trucker. I ended up, you know, I ended up working in the trades, though, when I was done school, I worked in the HVAC trade, my whole family's in that. So rather than me, like installing HVAC, like heating um, equipment, um, I sold it at the wholesalers. So that was my job for a while after um, I went to uh, college for a while here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that already a very wet uh, drinking environment? Um, some in in some some uh, jobs, it, drinking is part and parcel of it. As soon as the, yeah. the alarm goes, okay, we're finished with the shift. Down he goes. Definitely, you know, my whole life is that. So my family's were Catholic Irish, 
So we drink for christenings and birthdays. And so, you know, having that as a part of my life so long, I'm going to attract those kind of people and I'll want to be in those types of jobs. So that job after college certainly was the perfect opportunity for, to accelerate my drinking. Yeah. But you know, then it was fun because I was in my twenties. I was about to say, what, what did it give you? Oh, it was like, you know, where they talk about rocket fuel. It was definitely like that for me. And and one of my brothers who's also in recovery, well, the other one, yeah, there could be three of us, I guess, but um, we, it all, it gave us energy and it was always a party and it was so much fun. Like we'd have horseshoe tournaments and, and euchre tournaments and dances and people. And so it was always fun and energetic. I mean, then we still had, I I should speak for myself. I would still have like blackouts, but it was allowed, you know, it was the weekend warrior type of thing. Work hard, play hard. Exactly. That's exactly how my family is still to this day. My dad is like in his seventies, doesn't stop. Go, go, go. Yeah. (laughs) that's the same with me (laughs) Um, yeah and that's hard to live up to (laughs) (laughs) but it is it is such fun and the problem of course is you're borrowing the good time from tomorrow uh, because here you are you're actually tired you've done a whole days of work and you're tired your body actually says oh come on give me a break and you say no 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 come on let's have a drink and then guess what happens in my case I woke up Give me yeah. you know, a bottle of wine, then suddenly, ping, I'm awake. Yeah, Let's exactly. do something. And I like cooking, so I would cook, storm out of the kitchen. Yay! And, well, meanwhile, it's midnight, and uh, it is, I've done basically another work day um, now in the kitchen. And guess what? Next morning, I have to get up again at six. So shit sleep from the alcohol, shit sleep uh, because there was no time. Oh, does that sound familiar to you? Totally. <laughs> yeah. And with my family being so like, I grew up with all these people and cousins coming into our house and my mom could just accommodate everyone. And she's not the alcoholic, but it was her father. Then I'm the oldest girl in my family. And as I'm growing, I feel this obligation to like start having people come to my house. So my mom doesn't have to do it. But when I'm drinking, like you said, I could work all day, come home, cut the grass. And I've single parented for more than 10 years cut the grass, do the weed eating, get the barbecue ready, have friends over, get up the the next morning. (laughs) Nephews and nieces would come and stay and I'd feed like nine kids. They'd come to my house every other weekend. Then when I quit drinking, well, that's a whole other story that I can tell you. (laughs) Like literally a whole other story. Like, yeah, it was like being a different person. Oh, so obviously the, the alcohol helped you and totally. let you let you es- escape, I guess, to a certain degree. It certainly the alcohol initially was fun for me, but later on it was escape, escaping reality, big term. And yeah. what was the, the reality you wanted to escape from? Well, being in recovery, I worked on a lot of trauma. That So I was living... In alcoholism with untreated trauma, for one thing. I was trying to single parent and work a full-time job and coach soccer. And, you know, when you're in the thick of addiction, you try and do more and more and more to cover it up. So there was that. And I was still chasing that. I was still chasing that thrill that I got years and years ago. And then it was, yeah, just trying to get through the day because, you know, I'm single, I'm lonely. I'm not feeling comfortable in my own skin. I do not love myself. People saw all these wonderful things about me that I could not see myself. And I got to a point that, you know, for a long time I protected my children from, you know, stuff that had gone on in my marriage. And all of a sudden I'm at this point where I'm texting their father saying, I think the kids should come and live with you. And they weren't little, little kids at this time. And then it was like, what the heck? Like, what is going on with Shannon? And then... I, my mom would talk to me and this is what I, Dave, you know, like, um, I knew that I had to get help then because I was, you know, ready to leave my kids. And that was the last thing that I wanted to do, but I couldn't, 
you know, I, I get angry with people sometimes when they talk about suicide, they'll be like, oh, that person's so selfish. And it's not, it's about really, I was believing that the kids and everyone else would be better off without me. And me meanwhile, I'm like a backbone and I'm a, um, like being the only girl in the family, I'm a link to the family and, and, and people depend on me, but I was not seeing that at all. Like that's what alcohol, that's where it took me. So it was fun. And then it was not fun. So it was actually fun. And then it worked and then it was coping and then it was killing me and tearing my family apart. I call it suicide in installments. And that's, wow. yeah, I, yeah. That, that is what it does. Or it, what it did to me, it, it, Ultimately, it, yeah, you, you've, you've described my story in your words through your mouth, and it's scary, but it's also the reality for so many of us out there. When yeah. we're in recovery, we realize how common these themes are. And regardless if you are coming from a farm or if you're a high-flying CEO or a trucker or a teacher or a priest, it doesn't matter. The, mm -hmm. the feelings are the same uh you what made you change when was that change and what made you change um so just before i came in to well to, to aa to a 12-step program i was at my mom's and she and i was really impaired from the night before which happened all the time i was driving to work and intoxicated right and I said to her like I don't know what the fuck is wrong with me and it's words that just kept coming out of my mouth because I'm like why can't I quit drinking and I'm praying to God and I'm looking in the mirror in disgust and she said to me Shannon stop looking at the wrong and start looking at the right and it was just the seed that was planted and my brother had been to a 12-step program a couple of them And then it was just shortly after that, I woke up one morning and I'm like, I'm calling my mom. I'm either going to the psych ward or I'm calling AA. And I did. And I showed up and I'm standing in the parking lot and I meet this person that our kids used to go to daycare together. Like, thank God, because I don't know what if I would have went in. And I went, went in and I saw these people laughing. So I was like, what the heck? Because I thought it was, you know, you know, the trench coat paper bag kind of place to be. And I heard people talk and I don't really remember what they say, but that first time, and I just knew, I knew that I was in the right place and that there was hope for me and I didn't have to do this alone. And, and I heard that enough in that meeting for me just to go back to the next. And like, I mean, that's seven years ago, seven and a bit years ago now. Was so that, that was a single meeting, so that was not a rehab hospital. That was a normal meeting somewhere in a church, or where was it? Yeah, was it yeah. That I that I took myself. So I tried to get quit drinking before that. Like I had, and and I do. All, I practice all these modal modalities that I'm going to talk about, like Reiki, EFT. I went to see the Dream Healer. I went to priests and nuns and all these people to try and get better but I never was really honest about my drinking with any of these people including my doctor when my blood pressure was up through the roof and I have this angry liver right well I have Crohn's disease I just blame it all on Crohn's disease I was so sick I had surgery 12 years ago and I'm seven years sober emergency surgery for Crohn's disease I had two fistulas one burrowed a hole through my bladder and one through my sigmoid and I did not know how sick I was Like, that's how much I was drinking. I ended up being, like, in enough pain to finally go. But, like, you know, that's where it took me. But me hitting a rock bottom, and I, I remember going into that first meeting, too, and then gentleman, I'll never forget him, I love him dearly, says, you finally threw in the towel. And I just didn't understand that before recovery was, like, all this willpower that was like, I tried harder, I would drink more, I tried harder, my life would fall apart. And then when I just went like, I felt like Medusa on a stretcher going into that first one. I, it was just like, carry me, help me. I don't know, I just, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. And then it's like, I saw, 
the light. I saw my truth. I did not go to treatment, a treatment center, because I didn't want to leave my kids. But I did. We have something called Addiction Mental Health Services. I did programs for two years. Nice. Nice. Like some were 10 weeks, some were 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. And so it was the same type of work just in a longer period of time. And, and it was fantastic. Like nice. I learned to love myself. I can say that. Like I do cherish myself and I practice self-care and I see gifts. I would not even use that word gift before. <laughs> so it's, it's beautiful. When you walked into your first meeting there, you said you, you met this woman who was uh, who you knew from from early childhood, uh, picking up the little the little <laughs> runarounds. Um, yeah. So she was in that meeting, too. So she was yes. she was a recovering alcoholic. Yeah, she was in the parking lot and I was afraid to come in. And you know how you are. I was shaking yeah. and I was yeah. crying and I didn't know what I was doing. And she led me in and introduced me to people and sat me down and cared how for cool me. How cool is that? Yeah, how I know, right? How beautiful is that? Like, and, and, and it is most, and what you describe is, is the biggest achievement probably in your life that you actually walked into that meeting because mm -hmm. at that moment, you're truly at your lowest. At that moment, you are so scared. You are so, so, oh, my God. Oh, my God. The, the flood of negative emotions is just overwhelming. And you would yeah. find any excuse not to go in there. And that's right. So well done. Well done. When you were and as in... A very, oh, sorry. No, no, ladies first. I was just going to say, as a very independent firstborn woman in my family like the women in my family are so strong and I was the type of girl that's like I don't I don't need any man to take out my garbage you know what I mean I can handle my shit on my own I like I can hunt I can catch a fish I can feed my fish. like I was just so like defensive and so for me to like ask for help and, and then still to this day like in my recovery with my double hip replacement right now having to ask my family to like pick something up that I dropped <laughs> is extremely challenging for someone like me. <laughs> A very but extremely grateful that I did. And that's what I, that, that's what I talk about mostly when people ask me, like, do you have any, you know, when I'm working with sponsees or is ask for help. And that is, as I said, the biggest, the biggest achievement that you actually admit that you're powerless over your addiction. And yeah. especially when you were brought up and defined yourself, you are, you defined yourself by being this strong woman, this, this rock, this survivor, this hunter gatherer, all that. That often happens because you have to be. That often happens because you found yourself in a scenario where simply no one else could help you. Therefore, you had to survive. And then suddenly you frill in it. You, 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 you define yourself. That certainly happened to me. I was, I, was a, a, I was in the wrong place, wrong time, gang violence, and I ended up pretty smashed up. And that was in the 80s, and I didn't have any psychological help. So uh, within a month, I started training martial arts, became really, really good in it, and became quite the survivor, the lean, mean fighting machine, no doubt about it. Um, and I identified myself with that, and I became the survivor. And I made it look good. I made it basically, here, have a look how strong I am. I can beat anything, kind of a thing. And mm -hmm. in reality, that was my way of coping with the PTSD. That was my way of coping with the trauma. Did you figure out if your if your attitude, if your your hard woman kind of attitude, came from trauma? Um, yeah, I definitely think it stems from trauma, and then I think it just came from just my conditioning like watching my mom who was a power woman and my grandmother who was right. like this power woman and and like 
the women in my family don't have naps. And when I, my first slip, you know, we call them slips. So it really, that's me not choosing to pick up the phone. Instead, I drank. So my first time I chose to drink in my first four months of recovery, I did because I didn't get my son to church and I didn't want to hear from my mom kind of thing. So I started to drink, called my sponsor after that one, but was going to go for more. And then I remember being in a meeting and this man was talking about his experience. And he said, you know, my boss used to say, piss me off. And I would say like, F you, I'm going to go get drunk. That's what he did when in his active years. And then in, you know, in recovery, he remembered, no, like F you, like really that means F you, I'm going to go hurt myself or I'm going to go kill myself. So instead of me going to drink more that day that I, I remembered that from the meeting and I chose not to pick up and went for the na a nap for the first time in my life. Beautiful. So that was the turning point for me. So that hard core can do anything person had, that was a fork in the road for me. And I've been napping ever since. And then I also at that time, like had to explain that to my mom that day and then about, and then I, and then I actually pulled my kids from the altar and we, we, we haven't gone to church since because I found a much, oh gosh, meaningful, heartfelt, you know, God of my understanding, which is universal spirit that I've never experienced in the walls of a church. And I'll just long story short, it's coming out in my child and my children who have also dealt with recovery like addiction and recovery. So, so that was just a turning point to start softening me. My, my friend, she says, you're like a heart, you're like a candy, you're hard on the outside and soft and, and juicy in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so my heart, my heart shell Shannon that like took on the world and wouldn't ask for help is like, I didn't even want to be touched by people or, and then of course the hugging, we go to meetings and hug to now, like I'm a registered reflexologist and I'm, I have my Reiki and I, I'm, I have a side business of touching and treating and helping people heal. Like that would have been out of my radar. <laughs> and so out of your comfort zone, the human touch oh, can be so totally. powerful, so powerful. Uh, however you look at it, if it, if it is on a, on a, um, on a social level, if it is on a healing level, uh, if it is from an energy kind of level, it is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yet, how many people do recoil um, from someone who truly loves them and who truly wants to give them a hug? And from now and then I see that in, in people I meet and I just say, hey, can I give you a hug? And uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And you give them a hug and they suddenly initially heart and then they suddenly ah, oh, come yeah. like, 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 like pasta from hard to really gooey, soft kind of a thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And you feel it that they are absolutely needed that hug and needed to get the permission from someone to finally let that go for a bit. And that right. is, can be such a powerful thing. So it's it's completely interesting to me that you have gone the full the full 180 degree turn from from hardcore to suddenly yeah. exploring energy exploring healing exploring reiki sorry they, mm -hmm. they 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 don't do that on the farm in in our <laughs> if i go anywhere into a milking shed here in new zealand and say shall we talk about reiki shall we do a bit of I know, energy right? healing <laughs> yeah oh no my mom <laughs> yeah like that was it's almost like against our religion to like to even consider anything like that and there, there's there's a little story i want to tell you about too like um when you said like the full turn. So early in my recovery, I was cutting carrots at the counter and the kids were sitting in front of me on our, our stools. And, and as you know, in the beginning of recovery, you literally feel like you're inside out. Like it feels like you want to, 
you want to like stay in your body and hide from the world, but then you, you feel so exposed and you need to jump out of your skin at the same time. It's like this, you're turned inside out. So I'm cutting carrots or peeling carrots. And all of a sudden it's like, I can't communicate with them and I'm crying. And I was like, Oh my God, my kids are seeing me cry. And this, and I was just beside myself and I called my sponsor or who was working with me at the time. And she said, and God bless if I get emotional, but she said to me, Shannon, because I'm this tough shell, you know, and I don't want my kids to see this. She's like, Shannon, you've given your kids the best gift that you could give them. They saw you in your alcoholism passed out on the floor. They watched you walk in. They watched you stand at the counter, can't hardly cut carrots crying and being in your pain and, and feeling your emotions to the shining light that you are today. And I like, I, I, I saw it the opposite. So I didn't see that as strength and courage. And, and I see a gift that it gave to my, my children because my daughter ended up in NA for a while. And like on my title, I put smashed potholes and grit because smashed doorknobs and holes in the walls. Like when you live in a house with addicts, like, smashing things in the rage and potholes like you're just falling in holes and then grit in our family like we have pushed through like I see her now she's uh, becoming an electrician at 20 some years old she doesn't drink anymore she's working out and she's connecting to the universe and telling me her affirmations and how she said a prayer and saw butterflies and it's like wow like at one time we were ripping handles off you know and so I can see how them my children watching me go through that allows them to be human to be like broken to working through it to shining and we're doing it together and they've been amazing since I've had so I've been like laid up for six weeks with double hip replacement and a limp foot and they're cooking and cleaning and it's and I'm so so grateful instead of being angry. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? Because that is the, the, the truth. We know that there are about 50 genes that can get handed down from mummies and daddies to their children. So if you have got a strong family history, you are passing mm -hmm. down these genes, uh, which is quite likely that that will contribute to your children's future risk of addiction the reality is and the more important bit is that you also hand down the experience the crying at the in the kitchen table that is wow the you're turning around your transformation you're changing towards that woman that can actually talk about her insecurities the woman who can actually let light come into her own shadows and therefore push the demons further away. That woman who has taken herself by the balls, by the ovaries, I shall say, and get <laughs> and 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 get herself sorted. Now that takes that takes a lot, okay? And that is the powerful message that your children have seen. It is that that will keep them strong that will allow them to actually say, yes, mummy is a uh, hard ass, but at the same token, mummy is strong enough to admit that at times she is weak because that's part of us. And that is the yeah. biggest, biggest, biggest gift you could have ever given your children, okay? Forget the genes, yeah. forget everything else. You have shown your children the ability to survive by being open and being honest and, and breaking taboos by actually admitting that you're powerless at all those. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I'm so, 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 so pleased for you. I mean, the, <laughs> so you. I don't know how big your, your town is. So there was AA there and there was NA there looking after your daughter. Was there Alanon there? Was there actually a system there that, that where your children could go to and, and seek some counseling or help? 
Yes, there was Alateen, and I think they had went to one meeting, um, but there is Al-Anon. So I live sort of in the country part of the city, So, mm. but I'm 20 minutes to the city. Nice. And we have, um, yeah, Al-Anon. So I went to some Al-Anon meetings in my second year. That's what was recommended because um, my brother was in the thick of his recovery, and I was wanting to go and throw him over my shoulder and bring him because, um, you know, I watched my parents mm. on my father on his knees crying of all the situations that my brother had been in and, and his addiction was like way beyond mine. Um, and this is what I learned in Al-Anon because he had started coming back to meetings. So I want to save him because I was still working on that martyrdom part and that codependency part, you know, I hadn't worked on that. And I learned in Al-Anon that, this is the same woman. This is how she described it to me. She said, Shannon, if you show up at your brother's and he's on the doorstep in his own vomit and whatever, instead of picking him up and taking him to the bed and making him soup and caring for him and make sure he's okay, that's the codependent part. Like, I can't save him. You leave him in his own vomit and shit and put a blanket on him, and give him a hug and say, I love you. I'm here for you. Call me when you're ready. And then I was like, oh, all those relationships I've had, every single one of those very toxic, unhealthy relationships of these men that were these little boys that needed a mom that I was <laughs> because I was so needy because then, of course, now I got to see that. I'm needy. And as you know, the type of girl that I was like, I don't say that. Right. <laughs> was like, yeah. So I'm able to now healthy boundaries. I have that line where instead of going to help someone and they'd be wrapping their arms and legs around me and not letting me go and keeping me trapped. So I'd have to drink in that situation that I'm able to go and love them yeah. and leave them and tell them I'm there when they're ready. Like <laughs> what a powerful message. eh? And so simple. So simple. <laughs> Seven years down the line, it's simple. <laughs> I know. In, in your first year for crying out loud. <laughs> in, in, our, in our rehab, there was a saying, the only thing that changes in recovery is everything. And so yeah. it, is, it is so confusing. It is so weird because ultimately it's a bit like 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 uh, basic training in the army. You get stripped down to to nothing. Then you're being built up, and right. so and that's I guess what you're doing to yourself in a good recovery because you're throwing, you you take a really good inventory. You really look deep inside and trying to figure out what is there. And you look mm -hmm. at the good and the bad, and the bad, you, know, you throw those habits quickly out of the side. But that then at times leaves you rather, rather, who am I? Who, you know, what am I? So you, you somehow get rid of the guilt and shame. So that's good, because now you're a month to free sober. So that's cool. Okay, you feel a bit better, but I was empty. Who was I? And I didn't have an answer. I didn't have an answer for mm -hmm. probably a year. Uh, did you go through such a such an empty period? Well, I was so empty before. Huh. Um, I went through, I wouldn't really say it was empty. It was two things. It was like, you're right about being stripped down. Huh. I realized that I lived my whole life out of obligation, what other people told me, look at the Catholic rules and what everyone else want to do. Like I hunted and I fished and I did all these things and I do love to fish, but I hate hunting. Honestly, it's freezing cold. <laughs> You're up in a tree stand, you sit there and wait and I don't like it. And I liked it because I was drinking. Uh -huh. So yeah, like this, the whole transformation part of it was There was, a, there, there was a lot of loneliness, I'll say that, because I was so used to hanging out with my family for all of these things that we would do. I would go back to the cottage and want to play horseshoes and I couldn't do it because everyone else was drinking. So I was, I felt so alone and out of place in the place that is, was my family. 
And now what do I do? And I went through a time, so this is in the first year, where I would not go or I would go for an hour and then I'd go to a meeting and my family would go like, oh, does she not want to be with us? Does she stuck up now? Like, the, like this kind of thing, right? And so, yeah, so I would say deep, lonely time. So I had to do that until I got healthy enough to, to hang out with them sometimes mm -hmm. and be with whoever I want mm -hmm. all in between and express that to them. Like that was the hardest thing I'll say to my mom. Like, I just, I love my family. I just, I'm like a cat. I can only handle one hour of things at a time. Like one hour family, go for a bike ride, have a little nap. <laughs> oh, beautiful, beautiful. So how did you build up the new Shannon? What what came into your life that fear, that that uh, somehow changed that loneliness? Uh, women, the women. So I, I always hung out with boys my whole life, like mm. my brothers and their friends, and snowmobiled with their and drank with the boys in the garage. And there's all boys in my family. My daughter was the only girl out of nine of them at one point. So I connected with some really really amazing women in recovery and knew that I had to connect there somehow. And there was this uh, women's retreat of 36 women. And I was like, oh dear God. But my counselor was very similar to me. And she's like, Shannon, just pack your bag and go. You need to do this and you can bring your fishing rod. So I fished with people that had never fished. So that was great. But honestly, <laughs> Stefan, like I, the theme was, mindfulness and mindful eating and I connected with these women like I'd never connected with women ever before like I trusted them they weren't just girls that wanted to come and sleep with my brother basically and that is what I guess was a huge turning point for me and I think I was like nine months sober I can't remember if that was my first year or second year I was pretty early in and um and yeah Now I have lots of women friends and little groups and sponsees and sponsors. And, and you know what, women friends outside of the program. So I, I just joined a women's business group in the last year and was terrified thinking that I wouldn't measure up to these women that have these businesses and they're just like me. Yeah. And they have similar stories to me. And I just didn't know that. I was so sheltered in my little world. <laughs> And now they're seeking me. They're coming to me and, and wanting to know more about my story and want me to share my story. And yeah, it's been How remarkable. How beautiful is that, isn't it? And it just shows that the opposite of addiction is connection. There you are, you're connecting to other women and, and, uh, and you have come to a certain degree to the full circle now from, from this, uh, this, this broken woman like deer caught in the headlights uh, you are now out there and speaking out and you're becoming the torch of hope that a little candle of hope if you don't want to be the lighthouse um, but you are the message of hope and that is so powerful by you living your life and now to the fullest you actually show out and by admitting where you came from That is so powerful. People suddenly say, "You, oh, wow, you did what? And mm -hmm. oh, wow. And it is such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. And there are so many people out there who need to hear that message. I keep saying 95% of alcoholics will deny under all circumstances that they are in trouble. They are, it's part of our our being an alcoholic it's just a, a symptom of the disease denial and yeah. you actually by being open and showing that transformation showing yeah i'm an alcoholic yeah so what's your point kind of a thing you what how uh, uh you stop people in their track and make them think and give them that glimmer of hope and that is such a powerful message wow Uh, yeah, our addiction is about, it's not about what we drink or what we use. It's about the pain. So people understand pain. So when we share our story to others that are in pain, they hear our pain. So it gives them hope. 
it's not about the addiction and, and, uh, you know, I follow Gabor Mati. He's amazing man and so brilliant. And, and when I talk to other people about that, you know, when you're in a conversation and people are knocking somebody that's in an addiction in that place. And then I can say, you know, it's not about the addiction. That's about the pain. And that stops them in their tracks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the hard ass in you. <laughs> that's, that's the nice way of saying going like, how that's pretty judgy and how dare you when you have no idea what's going on. You know, that that's what really I want to say, but... Um, and that's, but and it's ah oh, that's again that that's the mirror that we need to hold in front of some of the uh, people's faces. They are so opinionated, but they are often quite extreme. Um, you know, it, it's it's the old saying that 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 some of the the biggest gay bashers were secretly gay uh, as well. Mm -hmm. As an example, so there you are completely going against the the, the addict. Oh, look at him! How dare he! And really, mm -hmm. this person wants to say, look at me, how dare I? Because they are the secret addict. They are right. deep in their depression. They are deep in their own trauma. And that's that right. is that is where we, by speaking out and by telling our story, we can hold the mirror in front of their face without getting confrontational and say, you stupid whatever look at yourself <laughs> kind of a thing but we do it yeah. in a roundabout way and mm -hmm. allow them to connect honestly with their inner troubled person that most right. of us are and admit to it oh it's thank so you thank you for bringing that up so when that happens i will send some more love towards that person instead of <laughs> going to the little itty shitty bitty yeah. committee over here going like how dare you say that oh uh, exactly exactly no i just i i then try to bring a story up if i feel something like that happening in my surrounding um i try to bring a story up from my own experience um and try to make them see uh that or from now and then if they really piss me off i actually say oh look hey, i'm an i'm an alcoholic um and or i say something that that stops them in their tracks um that's cool however i do no longer stay quiet i think if there's one thing that i've stopped doing is just yeah okay let them be kind of a thing no I make sure that I work towards something positive and communication and connection is the key thing there. And you are doing that. I mean, you're doing that in the, in the extreme way uh, by, by channeling uh, energies uh, through your healing. Now, mm. where did that come in? Because you were, you were broken. You, mm -hmm. you reassembled the new Sharon uh, Shannon, Shannon, sorry. Yeah. Shannon, I do yeah. apologize. The, the, That's the my mom's Shannon. name, though. All right, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so the new Shannon came slowly but surely mm -hmm. to light. And then mm -hmm. you somehow found light. You somehow found mm -hmm. the energy. Where yeah. did that happen? I know this is crazy. So um, I also have Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And I've healed naturally, mostly through eating and and well, just say eating. So I'm with my naturopath one day and I was so strict about my eating that I was reading pill bottles. And she said, Shannon, oh my gosh, I don't know anyone that knows their body like you because what do us addicts have compulsive minds, right? Obsessive compulsive. So I would study all about gut health. Anyway, so I'm so crazy over this. She says to me, you need to meet this woman who's coming from Ireland. Her name is Sarah Knight. She's in Kingston. And she does energy work. I was just like, at that point, I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm in recovery now. So I'm not drinking, but I'm in recovery. So I met this woman named Sarah and she did Reiki and bioenergy. And then come to find out she wanted me to be part of some of her groups, which is more connection with women. And I did something called the artist way. And I'm like, I'm not an artist. I'm a stick person drawer. And then I learned in that group, which was with beautiful women with energy, that my creativity and my artistry and my love can come through my food. It can come through. And then all of a sudden, 
I'm wanting to take Reiki and then I get my level three Reiki and then it just snowballed from then to, to where I am. Like I could tell you all kinds of stories, but <laughs> through all of that healing, I was able to get off all of my medication for anxiety. My Crohn's has been completely in remission. My doctors are amazed because they wanted me to go on all these other medications. So you know, AA and energy medicine and which is connecting with spirit in the big picture and trying to just be in this world. And that's what I've learned a lot lately is just about being instead of I'm home with this double hip replacement and I'm trying to manage everybody doing what I used to do in the kitchen and cut the grass and all this. And then I read this one reading and this it's called calling Jesus daily, like a daily reflections kind of thing. And it says, when you're trying to basically, when you're trying to figure thing out, every, figure everything out, you're spinning and spinning and spinning, and there's no place for me to land. So please just be still so I can land. And my partner and I read that together and we were just like, oh, cause he's in recovery too. We're like, oh my gosh, like and then I read one the other day and it was like, what I talk about, like when someone said, well, what's your higher power? And I grew up with the Catholic God, the guy in the sky with a beard. And it talks about, you know, the breeze that you feel on your skin and the trees and the little bird that comes up and kisses you is all of that is so, and the people, you know, I remember I almost went back at one time and the same woman that I told you about with the other two sayings, I met her in one of the grocery stores. I just happened to meet her. And she saved me from going out that day. So, you know, that's spirit and God and universe or whatever you want to call it. Now it's like, I see it everywhere and feel it everywhere on my good days and on my bad days or bad moments, I'll pray or say a prayer and then wait. And then it may show that day, but it might be the next day. You allow yourself to get off that little spinning Hams the wheel um, and actually just stop for a moment, press the pause button on your life and let let calmness come in. And that is such a powerful thing. That's so important. That's and it is it is a lesson that I still keep learning. And that is such yes. a such an ah, uh, because I'm I'm that proverbial energizer bunny. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, so <laughs> that is that is me. And that's how I like to be. I like to be this, this person to be out there kick ass. Um, but it shows. I'm so prone to burnout. It's no longer funny because I, I there's still this part in me that says rest is for the weak uh, mm -hmm. that kind of bullshit uh, but it was how how I brought myself up that was the survivor in me that was the, the the PTSD guy in me who constantly knows what is happening in a surrounding which made me a great doctor uh, which made me you know gave me many advantages in life uh, mm -hmm. but equally it can be so exhausting um do that 24 hours a day even in your sleep and no 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 it doesn't work it doesn't work i'm no look at me it doesn't work <laughs> so. and so lis listening to reminded me when i when i was with one of my practitioners while i was drinking and trying to get help she said shan your alcohol is your calm and i'm like what mm. I don't even know what that means, mm. but I look back and go like, yeah, that was my excuse to sit in the lawn chair and take a moment, right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's sometimes... But now I don't have that. <laughs> but no, that's that's what we alcoholics... Um, some. Uh, let's rephrase that. It is so important to understand that alcohol gives us something it can mm. uh give make us disinhibited that the shy introvert suddenly comes out and is the center of the party it gives us that moment of pause that mm -hmm. moment of pause in an in an in a, during a, a conversation where you don't know what to say but you take a sip or you do that many little little tiny bits where the alcohol has actually helped us now, mm -hmm. to just throw it all out and not learn new techniques, not learn mm -hmm. how to deal with those kind of things. 
that's where you set yourself up for the relapse. If you don't deal with the reasons that you have been drinking, uh, if you don't do that work, and that's where the AA program and, mm -hmm. and smart recovery, where all these things are so important that you actually look at what is happening. Why are you drinking? What are the advantages? And then counter them with something better. Well, mm -hmm. if you don't do that, you're, you're failing. You're, you're white knuckling it. That is basically, you're not recovering. You're just mm -hmm. not drinking. So now it's so beautiful that you say that because that is where some people say, I mean, someone asked me recently, um, okay, can you, can you get sober alone without AA? And I, the answer is, yeah, maybe. Um, I, I have never met anyone who actually is truly in recovery, who did all right. the work because you can't see what you need to do. You mm -hmm. can't hear what you don't say. So, right. and, and someone who has been there, done that, they can hear what you don't say, okay? Mm -hmm. It sounds bizarre, guys, but believe me for a moment, you need someone who can look at you and say, you're bullshitting, aren't you? And by them telling you, you suddenly realize, huh, yes, I am. I was lying to myself or I didn't actually admit to myself that something was playing a key part. My PTSD, I only figured that out two years ago. For crying out loud, I'm turning 55 wow. this year. Uh, my my biggest trauma uh, happened when I was 13. So there you go. <laughs> for far more than quarter of a century, I was just uh, quite happily, no, not happy. <laughs> That's the wrong word. I was, I was living my PTSD, but I made the right. most out of it and turned it You're into coping. something. Indeed. But then again, of course, I used the alcohol to numb me, to finally mm -hmm. go, ah. Oh. So yes. no. Oh, see, it, how, how bizarre is that? We, we two couldn't probably come further apart as far as our upbringing goes, as far as religion goes, as far as all the kind of things. We come from very mm -hmm. different backgrounds, yet our experiences are so alike to a degree. Mm -hmm. It's scary. And that is, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, isn't it? And that's the message mm -hmm. that, that I guess we too are sending out there. Guys, yes. you are not alone. You are not alone. Right. And it doesn't matter where you come from. It is, you know, alcohol is the bloody great equalizer. It doesn't care if you're rich or poor, if you're white, black, green, doesn't matter what your skin is, doesn't matter what, it does not matter whatsoever what you're doing. Alcohol will sneak in as that little ninja and will destroy your life as, as effective as a, as, a, as a cannonball. So bottom line is, it is, yes, whatever has happened, happened to you. You've had trauma, you have had, you've coped in a way that you thought let you survive. It might be drugs, that might be the alcohol, that might be gambling, that might be sex, it might be pornography, you name it. It's like eating disorders, all that. All these things have helped you somehow survive. Probably not to a great degree, but you actually are still around. And for that, I commend mm -hmm. you. Um, but if you're, if you're now at that point that you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, welcome. Welcome. This is the most beautiful place where you can be. This frustration, this, this reality check that you suddenly say, bloody hell. And I guess that's the reason that you're sitting here listening to us. Because, Shannon, here you are living your life seven years mm -hmm. down the line, being a healer on an energy level basis, but also being a healer as a sponsor, being a healer as a woman that others can come to and say, tell me more how you, how you got yourself out of that shit. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? And guys, if, isn't it? If Shannon and I can get our shit together, so can you, honestly. <laughs> totally. Honestly, <laughs> for crying out loud. Shannon, I mean, it's, you're, you're helping others nowadays. If people are really, really uh, taken by you and your message, how can they get hold of you? I mean, is there, is there, how can, how can they say hello, Shannon? And, you know, maybe it's time to talk or maybe it's time to heal. Um, how can they do that? So the easiest way to get a hold of me is on Facebook. It's Shannon Smith Levy. And then my business page is just Shannon Levy. 
that's how most people get a hold of me. Or my email is S-L-E-V-E-E-7-2 at gmail.com. Check down there the description of the video and of the podcast because the information will be in there. So, Shannon, I'm I'm very humbled and honored that you were so honest with me on my show and that you really delve deep into your own addiction and were strong enough to share that with the world here and this is this is such a a beautiful 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 sensation for me so you humble me truly you also you also put the mirror in front of my face uh, at various times we have to say oh shit yeah i remember that oh yeah okay i remember that um for that i'm ultimately grateful because you changed my day today you make me live my day in a more purposeful way in a more mindful way and i hope that not a hope i'm sure that the same will apply to many other lives that you've touched today on this show so thank for you. that i'm very very grateful <laughs> thank you and thank you for doing this um, I've listened to several of your podcasts and I've been sharing them too. And you are doing great work here. So mm. bless you for doing no. that. And this has been a, a, a wonderful experience. It's always mm. great sharing. You know, it's, it's one's more step in healing and helping others is the best. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Shannon, yeah. thank you so much. And you guys thank out you. there, there is hope. There is, there's life out there waiting for you. You can do it. Look, learn to look after yourself. Learn to love yourself, what's and all, and stay strong. And one more thing, please, please. Just it's it's okay to be human. It's okay to be human because <laughs> we forget that. <laughs> exactly, and human means yes, you're weak, you're tired, and yes, it is okay to take a nap. The nap can yes. be your new power, your new secret power, because you're actually recharging your battery. So it's so beautiful. Amazing. <laughs> All of okay, you. Okay, thanks so much, Stefan. Look after yourself. Bye. Take care.